Good morning. Today is Sunday, May 31st, 2020. My name is Max Rogers. I'm the pastor here at Northern Heights Baptist Church. It's great to have you with us today. I pray that the Lord has been gracious to you throughout this week. Being as today is the 31st, that means we are a few days closer to our future return here on the church campus. Next Sunday, June the 7th, we will meet again in corporate worship here on the church campus. We will have an 11 o'clock a.m. service. And my prayer is, is that if you feel comfortable and safe, that you would take time to come and join us here at Northern Heights Baptist Church. We are located on the corner of Pecan and East 8th Avenue, right across from Hughes and Wright's Funeral Home. Our physical address is 1102 East 8th Avenue, Cordial, Georgia. Today we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Peter had began, his, had began the very first sermon in the early New Testament church setting. Uh, today's text will be Acts chapter 2, 25 through 39, verses 25 through 39. Let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, I pray today that you would speak to our heart. Lord, as we continue this study here in the book of Acts, make it come alive for us. Father, may, us, um, may we be able to see uh, the passion that Peter had as he stood there and preached the very first sermon there at Pentecost. Lord, may we carry that same passion. May we carry that same desire. Father, to be faithful witnesses for you. Lord, we love you. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Verse 25 of chapter 2 says this, For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Peter is speaking here about Jesus Christ. Uh, verse number 25 says that Peter spoke concerning Christ. What David was saying here uh, is actually a prophecy of our Lord, of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, God's Son. We can find this quote that Peter is referring to in the Old Testament book of Psalm, Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. What, they, uh, what Peter is really saying here about uh, the prophecy, uh, the prophecy of David was speaking, number one, about the Lord's experience here on the earth. David's prophecy concerned Jesus' life, his, his everyday life, his everyday experience. You see, whenever Christ was here on earth, when he was walking, whenever he was ministering here on earth, when he was performing miracles, when he was praying for those who were sick and, and tending to those who were needy, as he was preparing to get ready to, to go to the cross during his uh, few years of ministry here on earth, he always saw God's face before him. God was always looking on Christ and Christ was always looking to God. He was gazing upon Him. He thought about God often, daily, all the time. God was always on His mind. His attention was always upon God. He concentrated on God, kept His mind on Him no matter what was going on. If it was a, a day that He was being persecuted, if it was severe persecution or even mild persecution, He knew that the Father had His side. Jesus was at God's right hand then, and friends, I believe Christ is at God's right hand right now. God was the provider for Christ, as He is the provider for us. God strengthened Jesus while He was here on the earth, the same way that, that He strengthens those who call out to Him and reach out to Him and believe in His wonderful name today. He guided Christ as He went through the, the different things here on earth, as He ministered, uh, as He performed the, the miracles, as He loved on people, as He wept with people. 
He upheld him. And he also knew, and Christ knew as well, that he would not be abandoned. He would not be forsaken. He was really, God was really the, the defender for Jesus Christ. Picture this, if you will, of someone in a courtroom that was standing up in defense of one who had been accused. Or maybe that of a soldier on a battlefield who was standing beside their fellow soldier guarding and protecting and defending them. This is kind of the, the same idea we have of the relationship between God and Jesus Christ. One standing for another. Not only did David's prophecy um, talk about the experience of Jesus' daily life, his daily actions, how he kept God on the forefront, David's prophecy also concerned Jesus' conviction that he would be delivered from death, from eternal death. Now we know that, that Christ's body uh, was lifeless on the cross. We read in the Gospels that he had given up his spirit. We're not talking about the physical death. Jesus knew that he would die a physical death. That was the cup that was given to him. That is what he willfully accepted. He went to the cross to die for you and for me so that we can have forgiveness of our sins. So we know that, that Christ's earthly body, the flesh and blood, perished on the cross. But my dear friends, it did not end with the physical death. Christ is eternally alive. He is forever alive. Always has been and always will be. He is at the right hand of the Father today. David's prophecy concerned Jesus' conviction that he would be delivered from death, from an eternal death. And it is because of Jesus' death on the cross, of his willingness to go to the cross, to take the burden, the, the pain, the shame, of our sin, the weight of our sin, the penalty of our sin, that we too can have eternal life, that we can be victorious, even though we will experience a physical death, we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. David's prophecy about Jesus also concerned his revelation. His, he was revealing the way of life. Jesus was revealing the way of life. God revealed the way of life to Jesus, and Jesus in turn revealed the way of life to us. Actually, when we look at the Hebrew, we see that the Hebrew reads the path of life. So God revealed the path of life to Jesus, and Jesus reveals the path of life to us. And if we walk on this path of life, if we accept Jesus Christ, if we believe Jesus Christ, if we have him in our heart and he has forever transformed us, then we will escape eternal death. Again, we will face a physical death. Every single one of us will experience that. But then after the physical death, something else takes place. We will either spend eternity in hell because we've rejected Christ, not accepted his gift of salvation, or we will spend eternity with the Father praising and glorifying Him for what He has done and how He has made us safe, whole, pure, and secure. Walking along the path of life means that we willfully choose to be in God's presence. That we willfully choose the countenance of God to be upon our life, to mark us, to guide us, to rear us. Friends, God will never abandon you. The same as He didn't abandon Christ. He will never abandon you and He will never allow an authentic believer to experience eternal death if we willfully choose to walk in His precepts. If we choose to practice His methods and if we choose to accept and implement His biblical, authentic teachings. Verse 29 Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would rise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption." Peter, when he was preaching this very first sermon, was preaching a very forceful message, a very powerful message. 
Peter said that David could not have been referring to himself for one simple fact that David was both dead and he was buried and that the people knew where his grave was. His grave was actually on Mount Zion where the rest of Israel's kings were buried. All the people had to do was just walk a short distance and they would be at the patriarch David's tomb. They knew that he was dead. They knew that he was buried, that he was not risen. There was something significant about David. David was a prophet of God and God had revealed to him that the Messiah would come through his line. The Messiah would be one of David's descendants and would sit upon his throne. Psalm chapter 132, Psalm chapter 89, 2 Samuel chapter 7 gives us insight to this knowledge. Therefore, what David was doing was he was predicting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even though he died a physical death, my dear friends, he is never eternally dead. This prophecy referred to Jesus and his resurrection. Peter said forcefully that Christ was raised to reign with God. That Christ was reigned to, uh, raised to deliver his soul from hell. We see that there in verse 27. Peter said that Christ was raised to deliver his flesh from corruption. The same way that the believer's body will be raised from the grave and we will be given a brand new body. The one who is corrupted will no longer be corrupted if our faith and our hope and our trust is in Jesus Christ. If we accept his gift of salvation. Verse 32, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Peter stands and he boldly proclaims, he says, you can believe what I'm telling you because I have seen it with my own eyes. Not only have I seen it, but the other disciples have witnessed this as well. God has raised Jesus from the dead. When we think back to the Easter account and how Christ came out of the tomb and how the stone was rolled away and then we read over the next 40 days Christ appeared uh, well over nine times uh, accounted in the Bible that Jesus made appearances. Sometimes he made appearances uh, to men as they were walking on the road to a man. Sometimes he made appearance to uh, many disciples at, 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 at one time or the other. And then there was at least one occasion where Christ appeared to over 5, 000, uh, 500 people rather at one time. Peter says you can believe what I'm preaching to you because it's true. I've seen it. I've experienced it. Verse 30. Three, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The exaltation and the extension of Jesus Christ into heaven is what Peter is talking about here. He says the right hand of God. The right hand of God is a position of authority. It's a position of, of honor, of glory. And that is where Christ sits today. He sits at the right hand of God. Christ has been raised to sit at the right hand of God. David prophesies about the Lord exaltation. Peter said that David could not have been speaking of himself because he has never risen from the dead. He has never been exalted in the way that Christ was exalted. David was prophesying that God, Jehovah, in the Old Testament had spoken about David's Lord, the Messiah, Christ of the New Testament, promising that Christ would sit at God's right hand and that the Lord would reign until God subjected all of his foes. He says that his enemies will become his footstool. He would be victorious. He would triumph over his enemies, both human enemies and spiritual enemies. Peter declared emphatically that Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. He said, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly, emphatically, he said that there is no doubt whatsoever that Jesus Christ is Lord. Verse 33, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. 
And this Jesus Christ who is Lord, this Jesus Christ who is the Messiah, is the one whom we have crucified. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? My dear friends, when they heard this, the Spirit of God was moving and it convicted their heart. And it led them to this question, what shall we do? And that is the question that we should have today. Father, what shall we do? The word cut, or maybe in your translation, uh, translation prick means to convict. This means it's going to sting, have a sense of pain and hurt. Conviction is when our heart is moved emotionally. It's when we have sorrow because we know that we have disappointed God. It's when our heart is broken because we have disappointed God, we have failed Him. It is a sense of uh, knowing our sin, knowing that we have done wrong. It, it, conviction means that we know that we need God and that we cannot do this by ourselves. It means that we have fallen short in aspects, that we cannot be obedient to God without His help. Conviction causes us to come to the same question that these men and women had. What shall we then do? Verse 38, Peter answers their question. Verse 38, then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. My dear friend, the answer to the question, what shall we do? Is to repent of our sins and be baptized by the Holy Spirit. To receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, we are sinners. I am a sinner. I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. Friend, you are a sinner. And you're in either one or two categories. You're either a sinner saved by God, or you are, a, or you are either a sinner who has yet to receive forgiveness because you have yet to repent and turn from your sin. Peter said, in order for them to be forgiven because they had crucified Christ, in order for us to be forgiven because we are guilty of crucifying Christ, we must repent before we can be forgiven. And when we are forgiven, we will receive the gift, the precious gift of God's mercy, His grace, and His Holy Spirit. Verse 39 it's really important because it expresses to us that not only was Peter talking to those who were in front of him, but he was referring to those of us 2,000 plus years away from when the words come out of his mouth. Verse 39, for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. You see, this is the assurance of God's promise. Verse 39 says it's to you, meaning the Jews. And then it also says to those who are far off, meaning the Gentiles, meaning me, meaning you. Those who are far away in distant lands. Those who are spiritually away from God. My dear friends, if we have not been forgiven and been cleansed by the precious blood of Christ, we are spiritually, you are spiritually away from God. This promise is made to both you and to me. If we will accept Christ, if we will believe in His mission and His work, believe that, that when He died on the cross, it was to forgive me of my sin, to forgive you of your sin, so that we would only have to experience a physical death, not an eternal death. If we would believe that God raised him from the dead, that he has been raised, that he is sitting at the right hand of God, that he has been exalted. If we would believe that, that he would come and save us. He will save you. And then friends, we do exactly what Peter's doing. Confess. 
witness. Proclaim the name of Christ. Verse 39 says, And to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. God is calling you today. What will be your answer? When the men and women heard the words of Peter, they said, what shall we do? Friend, ask yourself the same question. What shall you do? Christ's response is to repent, to turn, and to accept His new way. Walk on the path of life that leads to eternal forgiveness. You can do that right now. Ask God to forgive you of your sin. Say, Lord, I know that I need you. I know that I am a sinner and I repent and I want to turn from my sin. I make a willful decision right now to turn from my sin. I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, just as Peter had preached about in Acts chapter 2. I believe your death on the cross is payment, complete payment for the penalty of my sin. Thank you for paying for my sin. I believe that God raised you from the dead, that you are a risen Lord, you're alive, you're seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe that. And I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Please accept me. Please save me. And dear friends, if you do that with an honest, with an humble heart, God will hear your prayer. And he will reach down and He will save you and He will send His Holy Spirit to rest upon you, to bring you peace, to bring you comfort. And then you go and you confess. Let's pray. Father, I pray now that you would speak to our heart. Allow us to make the decisions that your spirit is calling on us to make. What shall we do? Save those who are calling out to you right now. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.